Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, Ellettsville Christian Church and our online service this morning. Glad that you could be here and, and be a part and join with us and join with our praise team uh, as we worship together. Folks, if you've got kids at home, I want you to gather them up uh, for just a moment here on this because I've got something to show you that will uh, just absolutely astound them on what they see. You've, you've probably heard of the, um, the Hammurabi Code or the, the Dead Sea Scrolls or perhaps the Gutenberg Bible. What I have here is, is something uh, that is ancient and old like they are. And here it is, it's ancient parchment is what's known as a road map. You used to use it, you, you would unfold it, and you would use it to plot out a trip. You would find out where you were on the map, figure out where you wanted to go, and then you would figure out the course of action or where, what you were gonna do. When you were done with it, you would fold it up for three hours, spend three hours trying to fold it up and get it back in the glove compartment. And the glove compartment, if you're not sure what that is, that's that little thing that opens up on the passenger side where nobody ever puts their gloves. But sometimes folding it could be very difficult, so usually you just set it aside somewhere and came back to it later. Now, you would probably do the same thing now on your phone with technology, or you might have some other little tool in your car, and, and, and the principle is still the same. You go from where you are to where you want to be, and it says, this is how long it will take you, how many miles you're going, here's the roads that you should take. But what happens if something changes? Uh, suddenly there are some unforeseen things that show up, a, a traffic jam on the interstate, or uh, a detour because of construction, or uh, there's an accident, or you even just go to get in your car, your car and it won't start. Suddenly your plans are thrown off. What do you do now? You, we can make our plans, but there is so much that we don't have control over. In this season of COVID-19, you may have had reality crash in on your plans. Uh, you know me, I was planning to have at least a couple of haircuts by now, but that hasn't worked out. More seriously, you know, students, their semester got changed up. They've had to study at home. Seniors in high school and college have had their commencements canceled or postponed. And across the nation, many of those senior year kind of rite of passages, those activities and those ceremonies have been tossed out. Most of us had plans for this spring or summer of things we were going to go places, uh, things we were going to do places we were going to go, and we've had to reevaluate them. They've been canceled uh, or rescheduled. Weddings have been moved around. Other people have seen their jobs lost or furloughed, medical procedures have been put off. So how do we handle all of that? Let's look at an example in the book of Acts. We've been using Acts to kind of guide us through and see the, G the difference that Jesus makes for us. And we pick up in verse 6 and we go through six, verse 10. It says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, uh, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Think about that just for a, a moment. Paul had some good things that he wanted to do. He had good plans for good things to share the good news in Asia and in Bithynia. 
And, and we don't know exactly how this came about, but we are told that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus in God, the Holy Trinity, intervened in some form or fashion. And then after all this, after Paul received his vision to go to Macedonia, they, they began to put the pieces together and they concluded that God didn't want them to go there, but instead he had another plan for them to go to another place. In my own life, I've had those moments. I really wanted to do something or go somewhere. I had plans, dreams, hopes. They didn't all pan out. And sometimes even, even very painfully so. So looking back, I can, I can see God's hand guiding me to where I am today. I just didn't know it at the time. So how can we maintain our, our sanity in the midst of these uncertain times and throughout life? How does Jesus make the difference for us between our plans and the reality that we experience. Well, the first step for us is to manage our own expectations of what we think the future is gonna be like. When I was eight years old, Lynn Anderson's version of Rose Garden was a huge international hit. And I can remember traveling with my parents, sitting in the back seat, sometimes maybe just laying down because we didn't have seat belt laws there, and you could just sit wherever you wanted, it seems, in the car. And I remember listening to that song, and I didn't understand it at all. That refrain, I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. It made no sense to me at all. This woman singing to a man about a rose garden. What man wanted to, to have a rose garden? Why would he be upset that he didn't get one? I didn't understand that it was a, a metaphor for the fact that we think and hope that life is going to be perfect. What we begin to understand is that things won't always be sunshine and gumdrops. So don't expect them to be. Manage your expectations. Jesus told us that following him would not mean we were entering into a rose garden, but instead his followers would be hated like he was hated. And they would definitely have trouble. The Apostle Paul would bear this out as true <clears throat> when he later recounted that in addition to hard work, his ministry had been marked by prison and severe floggings, beatings by rods, and being pelted by stones. He also endured shipwrecks, the dangers of bandits, and crossing flooded rivers. He knew hunger and thirst and other deprivations. Jesus' half-brother James taught that we need to have some humility regarding our plans. He wrote, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city and we will spend a year here or there, carry on business and make money. He said, why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, he writes, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So whether you're making plans for the weekend or you're plotting out a career path, remember that as the comic strip writer Alan Saunders said, life is what happens to us when we're making other plans. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't make any plans at all, just that we should be prepared for delays, detours, and even cancellations. We should hold those plans lightly in our hearts. And these changes, they don't, they're not always bad. We often don't know what we don't know. And since we plan around what we do know, if our plans go perfectly, we may miss out on something that we find that we enjoy or wind up being good at. Sometimes it's that new thing, that unexpected thing that brings us some newfound joy. So whether our plans are being executed perfectly, all is going as planned, as I say, or it seems to be falling apart, our response should be the same, to glorify God. Let's do that now with a song. When we think about God's will, 
we often focus on the questions of the specifics, specific to us in particular. Which, which career should I choose? Uh, what job maybe? Where to live? Who to marry? We, we sometimes come to the Lord as, as if he were a crystal ball and we're trying to figure out what our future looks like. A better approach for us is to focus on God's general will while discerning his specific will. You can find things like his, his general will, like it, just very simply if you um, go to the Ten Commandments. You know, something just says, look, here's what I expect, what I'm wanting for you. You know, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, etc." You know, in planning, we often talk about the difference between strategic and tactical plans. The terms tactic and strategy are often confused kind of back and forth. Tactics are the actual means used to gain an objective, while strategy is the overall campaign plan, which may involve complex operational patterns, activity, and decision-making that govern the tactical execution. For example, if you, if you think about uh, Eisenhower's interstate plan, on June 29, 1956, President Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act the, uh, into law, and the bill created 41,000 miles of a national system of interstate and defense highways. The strategy was to connect all U.S. cities with over 50,000 people at, at that time with speedy, safe, transcontinental travel, and if needed, would provide, permit quick evacuation of target areas in case of an atomic attack. Of course, if you've ever seen the, the interstate jams when a hurricane is coming, you know that that may not work out so well for us after all. But that was the idea. And to make all that happen, it required both an overall strategy combined with very specific tactics. We often want to know the tactical part of God's will especially for our lives, before understanding God's overall strategic plan. Let's go back to that, that passage from Acts 16 for just a moment. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. And we ask, well, why is Paul even on this journey? Well, in Acts 1, we read that Jesus had said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. There's God's general will. That's the general strategic part. The disciples passing along what they saw and what they heard. And we fast forward a few years, we read in Acts 13, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manaean, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called you. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and set them off. So now here we begin to see God's general will becoming specific for these people. Barnabas and Saul are mentioned, and a specific purpose is put into place. What follows are a series of mission trips. We're not told why they went, where they went. Did they discuss it, consider their options, and then move forward? That's a real possibility, based on what we saw in chapter 16, that they, they looked at the data, they discussed it, they prayed, and then they moved forward, finding themselves steered by God as they moved along. I've noticed that a moving car is so much easier to move than one sitting still. So I see that as Barnabas and Paul started moving, God started steering them, guiding them exactly where he wanted them to go. So if you want to know God's will for your life, begin by pursuing his general will, and then let him steer you more specifically. And let me say this, folks. If, if you ignore God's general will, you may not have much of a specific will lined out for you. Jesus said that those who can be trusted with little will be trusted with more. So start with the basics. If you go to the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, 
you can begin to see just some of the basics that Jesus has for us. You know, how we talk to one another, how we quickly reconcile with one another, how we watch what we see and what we uh, touch and uh, what we think about, how we uh, learn how to make sure that our yes means yes, that we keep our word, that we, we love even those who hate us. All of those things are right there in his general will for us. And if we'll learn how to do those, we can begin to see him move us more specifically. That's why Paul would later write, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then notice this, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. As you move forward in having your character reformed by God, you begin to understand his specific will for your life. So as we sing this next song, why not begin asking God to show you what it is in his general will that maybe you've been missing out on, that you've been ignoring? Let's sing together. A few years ago, I was driving from Cincinnati to Indianapolis when my car engine died. And I was able to coast over uh, to the side of the road and I called for a tow truck and then I did that thing that is sometimes the hardest thing to do of all. I waited and waited and waited. You know, when you first make that call, to a tow truck company, you, you, you just kind of imagine that they're suddenly jumping into response, like Batman to the Batmobile, you know, just got to get there, got to get that guy's car, got to get it moved. Instead, it seems like, you know, the snails go into action and everything just slows down and you have to wait and wait. And while you're waiting, you begin to wonder, did they forget about me? Are they lost? Can they not find me? Have they even started? What's going on? When our plans, when they don't go the way that we anticipated, and if we prayed and we sought God and we thought we were doing the right thing, we begin to wonder, where's God? What's happened? Or if things in your life really take a a painful turn for the worse, we can think, well, God must have abandoned us. And that's we need to do what can be the hardest thing for us to do. And that is to trust, to believe that God is still working. Right now with all these stops and all these starts, these cancellations, these rescheduling, these detours, these setbacks, it doesn't feel good. They're very frustrating and disappointing. You you begin to make a plan and then realize, no, you can't follow through on that. And maybe what's happening with you has nothing to do with the virus. Some of you, you plan to grow old with someone, but death or divorce ended all that. Perhaps you you plan to live somewhere else than where you're living now or to have a better job or a, a better position or even better health. And you may begin to wonder, has God given up on me? You may really feel like that, but ask, has he? Paul wrote to the Philippians that he was confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That is, until Christ returns. So God has a a big time frame to work with. And and what is he doing when he works? Well, Paul tells us in Romans, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. I've got to admit, I don't know how that works. I don't know how he does it. I'm not sure of his methods. Uh, I don't understand his calendar or his clock. But all I can trust is that through all of the brokenness that we experience in this life, all of the pain that comes to us this side of heaven, still, somehow, some way, God is at work in us and even through us for our overall good. The writer of Hebrews 
calls us to endure hardship as if it were discipline. And he agrees with us that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but even painful. But later on, the writer says, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So when our plans don't become reality, we have a different perspective that we can hold to, that we can adopt. God is always at work, redeeming our experiences into something better than we could have even imagined. The night before Jesus was crucified, he was praying about God's plans. And he admitted he didn't like them. He said, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me. That's a pretty bold admission. I don't want it to go this way. But then he surrendered to the plan. He said, yet not as I will, but as you will. That's a powerful prayer for all of us to pray. And the fact that Jesus followed through on God's will is good news for you and me. It means that he took the penalty of sin for us so that we can be reconciled to the Father. And that's what we want to remember when we take communion. Through it, we are reminded of God's overall plan for creation and of his love that draws us to him. As our praise team brings us this next song, please take the elements that you have, the, the bread and, and juice or whatever you might have. Um, please use the time for communion that you're, and give thanks that God is somehow and in some way working all things out for your good. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for coming to us through Jesus and working through him to work in us. And as we take of these elements, this bread and this cup, help us to see in it you working all things out for our good, beginning first with our salvation and through, then through working with us, through us, for us, throughout our lives. We give this time to you, Father, and we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.